Welcome back to UATV Spotlight. Our next guest is a regular contributor to National Geographic and the New York Times. He has been commissioned by the Red Cross and various United Nations organizations. He has been granted awards from Harvard, Getty, and too many more to list. A world-renowned photographer, journalist, and documentary filmmaker, please welcome my guest, Juan Arredondo. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So I want to talk to you first and foremost. Um, you're a photojournalist, a documentarian. How would you describe your work? So, um, I mean, nowadays we call ourselves visual journalists. Um, I think I, when I started, I started as a still photographer. And slowly I started to realize my clients, but also the medium and the industries changed. And they wanted me to start doing more uh, film as well, gather sound. And so um, I quickly started to migrate into other formats. Um, I was born here in the U.S. in New Jersey, but my parents and my family uh, live in Columbia, South America. And I grew up there, so I decided to go there and start documenting the familiar, what I've, I've known from a long time. And in Colombia, it's a country that has a lot of social issues. Um, in the region also has a lot of social issues, political upheavals, revolutions, um, humanitarian uh, problems. And so um, I felt that if I could document that, uh, I could work anywhere. Sure. So um, I quit my job eventually and I moved to uh, South America and I began freelancing from there. Yeah. So I noticed on your website there was a um, piece that you won multiple awards for. I went into conflict. So it was a story I began, uh, I started as an assignment for the International Red Cross. Okay. I was doing a profile of one of their delegates um, and then we uh, were given access to a camp. Colombia has two rebel groups, two leftist rebel groups, one of them being the ELN, um, that's an acronym that stands for Liberation Army. And when I got there, I was shocked to see that this front, um, made out of 25 members, all of them were teenagers. Wow. Uh, some of them as young as 12 and 13, and they all had weapons and camouflage and grenades. And um, it's struck me as odd because I always thought of child soldiers in Africa, in Asia, right. uh, never on this side of the, of the world. And so um, I guess that's, I just began to think about how did they get got to this point? Who made those decisions for them? Did they make those decisions to be joining a group? And I wanted to dive into that world. And so for almost three years, I began uh, photographing the villages, the communities, the families, the kids, and see what happens to them from the right. moment they're recruited to the moment that they reintegrate into society. I guess as aspiring journalists, I, something I think about a lot is um, there are stories I'd love to cover, but I think to myself, I could never enter that community. Yeah. You know, how did you... So, yeah, that's a good, a good question because uh, it, can, it can look very intimidating, especially a topic like that, um, because there is an inherent risk associated. Yeah. Um, you're, you're at the mercy of an armed group, an illegal armed group, a terrorist group, that, well, you know, they can change their mind halfway when you're even at their camp. So uh, at first, uh, because I was with the International Red Cross, I had no problems and I was given access to the camps and to photograph some of the children. But I was more interested to see what happened, uh, you know, the root causes of um, forced recruitment and why kids are being recruited and this phenomena right. uh, in, that, in those different communities. So to access those communities, you usually have to talk to a leader, a social leader, someone in the community who does really, um, one, sees that the story that you're doing is important. Right. Um, and sometimes it takes a lot of trips just to go, meet in person, uh, you know, expose what you want to do, explain what you want to do, and tell them you know, ultimately what your goals are. Is there an example that sticks out in your memory of a time where you went in thinking, I know what I'm reporting on, and then you came out like, that was not what I expected? Yeah, oh, um, you know, I, let me think. They put me on the spot here, but let, so, let's start. Yeah, no, no, but so let's, uh, the child soldier story was, a, was one where it confronted me with several things. I already had a preconceived notion of these terrorist groups. Um, I grew up in Colombia. I've seen what they've done to the society and to communities. And so I already had a, a prejudgment going into the story. 
And, um, and it, that challenged me because I had to sit down with people who for a long time we were afraid of, I was afraid of. And to realize that, you know, there are also a, hum a human being. These are teenagers who, for many reasons, ended up, uh, you know, holding a, a AK-47 or a machine gun. Uh, and you have to leave that judgment behind the door. You don't have to leave it at the door and you just have to hear the other person and right. try to get their view of why they got there. Um, you know, and it's a lot of often that word humanizing gets thrown out. Um, you know, it could be dangerous because people say, well, you're humanizing a terrorist. But uh, I mean, it's a teenager, it's a, chill, it's a child. Yeah. So um, they are being, they're a victim of, of somebody's plan to use them and abuse them. And so um, that's where I stand in those situations. So I went in thinking, you know, I'm just going to photograph them, maybe fighting, maybe just uh, as these killers, as these armed groups. And I, you know, opened myself to talking to the families and hearing their point of view, um, hearing also the children's point of view. And some of them, you know, they joined because they were starving. They didn't have right. enough to eat. Uh, and they saw in this group a way of um, of getting that security. So I oftentimes pose that uh, view of child soldiers. You know, why why would they join a group, an armed group like that? Right. And if you start thinking about it, well, they're looking for security. They're looking for recognition. They're looking maybe for safety. Uh, in this case, they were looking for food. Um, so you've covered many kind of dangerous stories mm -hmm. or found yourself in dangerous positions. Mm -hmm. For journalists graduating college who are thinking, you know, I may want to go cover yeah. abroad. Is there anything that like we may not be thinking about that you yeah. are now like, I wish I had yeah. thought about this yeah. before? Yeah, so I was very cautious when I, I mean, unfortunately when I, I, I chose to do this, I wasn't thinking of looking for danger. Right. But some of these stories are in dangerous places. Um, so the one thing is, uh, and we saw this in 2011, a lot of young aspiring photojournalists went to Libya. This is the fall, you know, this is Libya. Uh, Gaddafi was being, mm -hmm. um, it was toppled and it was a mess. It was, you know, the country was going through a change and a lot of people saw an opportunity to go there and try to make a name for themselves. Right. And they, some of them were killed, some of them got injured. Um, so that's the thing you should not be doing, okay. right? And, and there are ways, there are uh, steps that you can take before going into one of these dangerous areas. Um, so one of them is training. I think training is very important. Um, there's a lot of hostile environment trainings offered by former military. Uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists also have grants, they have a lot of resources well. to um, help uh, journalists, it doesn't have to be photojournalists, journalists in general, how to go about these kind of situations. Uh, what kind of gear do you need to bring? What kind of insurance do you need? Uh, there's also, I've also taken first aid uh, training uh, to aid colleagues or even for me how to do a tourniquet if I get wounded. Right. So all those kinds of things um, are important before going there. And also understanding the culture, the place, uh, and, go, and also relying on your colleagues. A lot of times, you know, I would text or call a friend before going to another country and say, hey, can you kind of give me the lay of the land? What, what to look for? Where should I stay? Um, because the people that are in the ground know much better. These days I'm working <clears throat> in a couple of different projects uh, talking about embracing uh, different formats. So I just finished um, uh, photographing for the New York Times Magazine, so hopefully that will come out in the end of this month or next month. Um, but I'm also uh, uh, filming uh, two documentary series for PBS, things on Instagram as well. Okay. And that's usually where uh, these days photographers, that's their space. Okay. So I do post more things there. But um, yeah, that and um, you know, find it and I, I contribute often to Night Nat Geo, National Geographic and the New York Times. So um, hopefully you guys will see those stories there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you guys for watching. Be sure to check out Mr. Arredondo's work on his website and Instagram. And we'll be back with another episode soon. Thank you.